Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 6 of the Order of Melchizedek, A Message to the Neophyte by Enoch Penn. The Fourth Degree, Chapter 5 In the effort to bring to the mind of the reader a perception of certain truths heretofore unknown to him, we are faced with the difficulty that a statement conveys but little meaning to the mind unless has been had an experience that enables one to grasp its meaning. If a child that was just learning how to add were to ask his big brother the meaning of the strange marks in his algebra, no amount of explanation would convey much understanding to the mind of the child. The algebra is a sealed book to the child and must remain sealed to it until the rudimentaries of mathematics are mastered. This is also true regarding the teachings of the Bible. Because men have not practiced these parts of the Bible which they cannot fail to understand, they have not yet had those experiences which alone can make the rest of the teaching intelligible. To those who do not practice the teachings of the Bible which they do understand, the Bible must always remain a sealed book. But it is not sealed to those who put its teachings into practice, for that practice results in experiences which, step by step, make the rest of the teachings plain, but we can see that to no other person is an understanding of the Bible necessary, because of the fact that experience alone can give a true understanding, no matter how clearly and carefully the truths beyond one's experiences may be declared. The statements regarding them must always seem spacious and uncertain, so we see that it is not the fault of the writers of the Bible that God's message to man is not clear and plain. It is the fault of those who read but do not practice what they read. In taking the fourth step or degree, the neophyte in the order of Melchizedek starts out to conquer the power of Mother Nature to bind him and prevent him from rising out of her controlling power. Mother Nature is largely the expression of the creative principle cohesion, or to be more nearly exact, cohesion is the mother principle in nature, that which holds and binds. When through the father's creative impulse, the mother conceives a son, her bonding power, cohesion, enables her to gather the substance wherewith to build that conception into the likeness of its father and to retain him within the protecting limits of her body, until he is strong enough to live without her. These words in 1 John chapter 3, 9 and 10 have perplexed many Bible students. He that is begotten of God doeth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is the begotten of God, and this the children of God are manifest. These words show us that when one retains his seed in his organism, the life that is in the seed begets in him the beginning of a new, a physical consciousness which is the beginning from God. As month by month he still retains his seed, that impulse of begetting from God which is in the seed becomes a continuously repetitive impulse that causes the man or the woman to pass through the period of spiritual gestation until he has grown to where he, the soul, is able to live without Mother Nature's protecting and restraining power. It is time for him to be born and that implies that it is time for him to escape from his mother's binding power and enter into the realm where his father and elder brethren are, to breathe the same air that they breathe to see the same light and to live from the same life as they. In taking the fourth step in the order of Melchizedek, the man is seeking to escape from the limiting, the binding, power of Mother Nature. The neophyte's experiences in the first three degrees should have developed in him a good measure of the righteousness and true holiness which constitute the likeness of God. Therefore, in the fourth step, he begins the struggle to take the dominion. We may say that one of the great battle efforts of Mother Nature is to impel all living things to obey the impulse expressed in the words, be fruitful and multiply. As the forces of nature working together have brought the neophyte up to this point, he now rebels, so to speak, against his mother, the same as if a child were to say to his mother, henceforth, I will no longer obey you, 
but you shall obey me. There are several places in the Bible where this phrase of the struggle between the neophyte and his mother to decide if he is strong enough to be free is illustrated, especially in the story of Job. Also in the story of the arrest, the trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. In the story of Job, the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? Satan answered to the Lord, and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not set a hedge about him? But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. The hedge Satan spoke of is a certain protection which is generated to everyone under normal conditions, and especially to the neophyte in the beginning of his efforts, from the malevolent intelligences on the unseen side of life that Jesus called devils. These devils, who influence persons and their environment, do not, as a rule, permit their victim to see the part they play until he perceives and learns their methods of operation and begins to resist and overcome their influence. Then in their efforts to maintain their influence over him, they sometimes show themselves. This hedge is sometimes taken away by an act on the part of the neophyte himself, and that act is, in effect, to challenge to combat all the generative forces, which includes the malevolent intelligences in the astral. From another point of view, it is to open and pass through a door into the astral realm. But the Lord set a limit to Satan's power, which limit was that he must not touch Job's person. Passing through this door is as though one were to go into a new locality and say to those whom he found there, I am master here, and you must all do as I say. This would result in having to meet each and every one of them in combat, with them choosing the manner, time and place of the struggle, and he would have to conquer them all before he would be recognized as master. The attainments and the regeneration are not to be had by any system of magic or spiritual hocus pocus, so that a weakling or a profane person can have them. They are reserved for men and women who are mature and clean in body, mind and heart. When the neophyte has thus challenged to combat all that belongs to carnal generation, including all the evil spirits in nature, he has taken that irrevocable step. He may never again return to his childhood's protection. He has asserted his manhood and must now prove himself to be master or remain a servant to the end of his life. It is even as Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent taketh it by force. Or as translated in Wilson's emphatic diaglot, the kingdom of heaven has been invaded, and the invaders seize on her. These statements do not sound much like dying and going to heaven. After Job found that his property was gone and all his children were taken from him, he still remained faithful. Then the Lord called Satan's attention to Job's faithfulness, and Satan said to the Lord, Put forth thy hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thy hands, but spare his life. The only limit that was set upon Satan was that Job was not to be killed. His friends and his wife now turned against him. After Job still held fast his integrity, then even God himself seemed to turn against him, but his faithfulness finally conquered, and he received all again and more than all of which he had been deprived. In the beginning of his struggle, Job cried, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, God. In the midst of his struggle, he declared, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and though after my skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. At the end of his struggle, he cried, Now mine eye seeth thee. In the beginning, this fourth step, the neophyte meets one of the gravest of paradoxes. It is written in Revelations 21, 7 and 8. 
He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving shall not attain to divine sonship and eternal life. Again, we read, the simple believeth every word, and we have the saying, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Here is the difficulty. The neophyte must not be too fearful, too timid to go forward. But he must not be rash. He must not be simple, gullible. But he must not be too slow to believe. In other words, he must use carefully all the knowledge and all the wisdom he has gained by his previous experiences in the other three steps if he would attain it and pass through the fourth step. To be able to believe enough but not be too credulous. To be mentally alert, but not to depend wholly on the intellect. To be sufficiently courageous, and not to be rash. Here is the grave danger. For, alas, sometimes a neophyte in his rashness breaks through that hedge, which has been set about him to protect him, until the time when sufficient knowledge has been gained, and with strength to make it reasonably sure that he will be able to overcome the enemies he has to meet. Four, to repeat, once that hedge has been broken through or taken away, there is no turning back to the old condition. The neophyte must conquer or remain a servant of nature. The fourth step is depicted in the story of Jesus from the time of his arrest until upon the cross when he cried, It is finished, when there is no evil that can come upon the neophyte which can change him from his fixed purpose to be righteous before God. And that is saying much more than at first appears. Then he can say, I have overcome the world. It was said of Jesus that he was holy, harmless, and undefiled. The neophyte becomes holy when all that he is and has is set apart to the service of God. He becomes harmless when he no longer feels or thinks or speaks anything that will injure another. And when the evil forces that come against him are received without resentment, for a force so received is nullified and the earth is thus cleansed of that much of the evil men have created. In this way, he bare the sins of many, he was wounded for by our transgressions. He was bruised for by our iniquities. And with his stripes we are healed. And he is undefiled when he no longer loses his seed. When a man has come to know God, then the veil which has separated man from God will fall away. This refers to a certain experience. It is this. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess or introduce before my Father which is in heaven, or as it is stated in another place, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. This refers to the fact that after the neophyte's victory over himself, there will open before him a door in heaven, a door opening into the abode of those holy men and women who compose the order of Melchizedek. And he will stand in that doorway between heaven and earth. And if there is no evil in his heart, Jesus will introduce him as one of his to that body of divine souls in heaven, whom he called the Father, and to the angels of God as a fellow. The veil is gone. He stands in the presence of God. And henceforth, though he still may be despised and rejected of men, he is accepted of God. And the master can say to him, Ye are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. Whenever there is an occasion, he may, by right of his divine sonship, enter and stand in the presence of God, in the presence of those who created man. The first efforts of the neophyte are not so much to control the workings of nature's forces, as to prove that nothing in nature can control him. Pilate said to Jesus, Know you not that I have power to release thee, and that I have power to crucify thee? Jesus did not resist, for his present purpose was to permit them to destroy him. There are times when the neophyte, in bitter distress and loneliness, realizes the feeling of the master when, rising from his knees after his anguished prayer to be spared the suffering of the morrow, he said to his disciples in piteous reproach, could ye not watch with me one hour? 
and he realizes something of the meaning of the words. He trod the winepress alone. Though the neophyte may not say, as did Jesus, for this cause that came into the world, yet he must suffer until it is finished. Toilsome effort, pleasure, pain, these his body will continue to experience, but they touch only the surface of his consciousness. They cannot disturb the inner man. He understands now the words of Jesus. My peace I leave with you. There is another grave danger which the neophyte must meet, and the danger lies in its subtlety. We speak of Job's comforters, those who assume to be comforters in time of distress, but who really condemn and try to show one that he is in the wrong when he is right. Job held fast his integrity and pristinely declared his righteousness of his actions, declaring that these evils which he endured were from God and for some unknown reason and purpose and not because of some wickedness on his part, as his friends tried to make him believe. This is a subtle trial, for if the neophyte is in the wrong and refuses to see it, he will be condemned. And if he is in the right and allows himself to be persuaded that he is in the wrong, again he is condemned. To be right and to know that he is right and to refuse to accept that he is in the wrong and feel condemnation, that is the task. Here the neophyte's only hope is with perfect honesty of heart to use all the discrimination and self-analysis he has to preserve and to accept the facts, whatever they may be. The neophyte will find at this point that friends will come to him, apparently in all kindness, and will try to show him wherein he is wrong, and when he sees that he is in the right, yet if he does not attempt to justify himself or thinks it is best not to explain, his friends will say he is unreasonable, obstinate, self-righteous, etc. But he must be careful in seeking to justify himself, and again, at times they may be difficult to perceive clearly the dividing line between self-justification and an explanation that is properly due. Though usually it is not wise to attempt to explain, and if the neophyte takes the stand as did Jesus, which of you convinceth me of sin? That is an attitude that is safe only for the perfectly innocent. Another feature of this subtle test is that at times he may be praised or, in some manner, honored. But to permit himself to be elated because of the praise of men is to fall. Jesus said, I receive not honor from men. When these subtle trials come, the neophyte needs to consider well the words of St. Paul. Happy is he who condemneth not himself in that which he alloweth. A man's body is a vital machine, and life flows through its streams and impulses as the air flows. These streams and impulses of life impinge upon and flow through the organism and cause sensations, emotions, impulses, and thoughts which make him conscious. And as the neophyte gets fuller control of himself by withstanding the attacks of his enemies, he finds that not only is he a receiver and expresser of the vital currents which play upon his body, but he is, as well, and learns how to be a sender, a causer of vital streams and impulses, and in this he begins to take the dominion. When the neophyte has gotten to where he can refuse to be controlled by the evil influences that assail him, he has learned also that he can and how he can control these influences and can drive them away from himself and also from others to relieve them in times of distress. In her effort to retain her children under her control, Mother Nature brings to her aid her strongest ally, woman. Woman is an epitome of her mother, and through the woman controlled by the generative influences, her mother works unhinged. The neophyte will meet, or Mother Nature will bring to him, women who seek to serve their mother's pursuit, perhaps on their part, not knowingly, but in fact. In every condition and sphere of life, 
man finds that woman can be a great help to him and indeed we understand that it was to this end she was created. In the neophyte's extremity he commonly turns to woman for that strength and help to assist him to bear or to do what he needs to do and which help he feels he can receive through her sympathy and love and now is the time of the gravest danger for women's power to help is no greater than her power to hinder. If she is not wholly cleansed from all generative impulses, he may be going for help to one who, because of his lack of knowledge of her weakness, may prove to be his worst enemy. With this woman seeking the regeneration, this experience is also true. Her hunger for love and companionship may prove to be so overwhelming as to cause her to accept the love of one who does not seek to rise or who does not have the necessary knowledge and self-control to enable them to walk together hand in hand upon the path, and great distress, if not disaster, is sure to follow. Be not deceived. In the generation, nature distracts men's actions as she does with the animals. In this, men need no teacher their work being only to maintain the race while gaining, by the many experiences, the knowledge and moral sense needful to enable them to rise to a higher state. For in the regeneration, man is rising into a higher state of life and consciousness because the laws and manner of life in that higher state differ widely from that he is now in. He must learn the laws of that realm and train himself to live in harmony with those laws if he would enter and abide in them. To carry on the work of generation, man needs no more knowledge than do the unthinking animals. He needs only to follow his natural impulses unthinkingly. Yet to obtain the good he desires from nature, he must think and know and strive. And this thinking and knowing and striving how now developed in many the ability to rise through the regeneration into a higher and better world of life and consciousness. Man has gained that of nature's good more than have the unthinking animals by thought and effort, and without such careful thought and effort as will give him a knowledge and understanding of the laws and manner of life of those in the higher world he cannot enter and abide in it, as nature's laws are merciless and the violation of them brings disaster, so those natural laws of that higher life being violated bring disaster. The purpose of love between man and woman, being that they shall be a help to one another in their efforts to rise out of the state of animalhood into the state of divine manhood. Every effort they make must have that objective in mind. This implies a knowledge and the application and obedience to the natural laws involved. The chief reason for the disappointment on the part of those who have sought to attain the regeneration by the way of love, for man can attain the ultimate without human love, has been that the pleasing sensations experienced have so far attracted the attention from the real purpose that that real purpose has been neglected. We can see by this that every physical good received becomes a temptation to stop and enjoy, and every new power gained can become a snare to entrap the neophyte through his ambitions. Regardless of all else, the neophyte must hold fast to his original purpose unless they who seek advancement in the regeneration through human love hold it as a means to that end and seek that end through a knowledge and application of the natural laws involved, they shall fall dismally and find misery and darkness of mind instead of happiness and advancement. In the story of Eden, we are informed that God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And the Apostle Paul said, regarding the story of Abraham's two wives, This is an analogy. Hagar, being a slave, could bring forth only a bond child, while Sarah, a free woman, brought forth the promised heir. The analogy is this. Paul here alludes to a certain thing which the women seeking the regeneration should know and consider. Of Sarah it was said, it had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. This refers to the fact that when a woman starts to attain that regeneration, as she rejects the influences impelling her to generation, 
Aside from improving general health and a feeling of buoyancy, the first apparent physical result is that she begins to recover from what has been termed the wound of the fall. Her monthly flow gradually decreases and begins to come one lunar sign earlier each month. In time, if she continues faithful in her efforts, her moonly weakness will disappear altogether. She will then have recovered from the wound of the fall and regained her virginity. This is not the result of old age when the fires of life are burning low, but because she has gotten such control of her life that she can refuse to be controlled by Mother Nature's impulses to generation. She has conquered the power of Mother Nature to hold her in bondage to generation. She has become a virgin again. And it is not until then that the neophyte can turn to her with safety and confidence for the help she can give with her love and sympathy. Let the neophyte not be deceived until the woman has regained her virginity. If she does not know the law, she may be too weak to stand against the opposing influences she will meet, even as was Eve, in which case she may bind him helplessly in generation, from which they are both trying to escape. Apparently, the gravest test the woman will meet is that motherhood, the family, and domestic life will begin to appear to her imagination as the grandest, highest, and holiest life work and promising supreme happiness. As she returns to her virginity, she becomes as a little child, and we read, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put unto you none other burden, but that ye have already. Hold fast till I come." And he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. Jezebel is the woman whom Mother Nature will bring to man with the idea that she will be a help to him, who, with her mother's psyche, Serpent influence will try to turn him into bypass so that he may fall. The words, I will give him the morning star, implies that he receives the promise of the approaching eternal day. We speak of an iron will, the iron scepter being a symbol of a will strong enough to control and direct even national affairs. The evidences are clear that by this time, the neophyte has so far developed his will through his many trials that he has learned largely to refuse to be controlled by the extraneous forces which play upon him. And at the same time, he learns to control and to use these forces according as he wills. One of these powers operates through what is called mob psychology. The vast majority of people are controlled wholly by their feelings and he who can play upon the feelings of the masses can control them. The idea of a person unseen and unknown controlling bodies of people was illustrated in the story of the besieged city of Samaria. See 2 Kings 6 and 7.
in this story, the king of Israel sent to take Elijah and cut off his head. Elijah exclaimed, What should I wait for Yahweh any longer? As much as to say, he perceived that Yahweh intended for him to act in this manner according to his own judgment, and the result of his action was attributed directly to the Lord. For the Lord made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, and left their tents and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. The words of the prophet, Shall I wait for Yahweh any longer? clearly implied that the prophet acted by himself to fill the Syrian army with fears so that they fled from their own imaginings. This promise of the power to overthrow nations cannot be had in its fullest until the neophytes, as sons of God, have gathered together to work together as a unit. This gathering of the sons of God was foreseen by the psalmist when he, as the mouthpiece of the Spirit, cried, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, by the sacrifice of their carnal nature. Those having made this sacrifice understand the words, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall save it. It is not until the time that the sons of God are gathered into one body that they shall, take the kingdom and the dominion under the whole heaven. It is not until then that the promise, he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron, will be wholly fulfilled. And this will be the fulfillment of the promises. The meek shall inherit the earth, and the saints shall judge the world. Then these can say as Jesus did, all the powers given unto me in heaven, the psychic world, and on the earth. In the first step, the overcoming of the power of sex influences to control him, the neophyte attains the ultimate of that step, which is power. For as he conserves his seed, he finds that his consciousness and his powers increase, and as through discrimination he gathers the jewels of truth along the way, he finds that he is becoming rich with the truths of a spiritual life. In the third step, as he rearranges his knowledge into an orderly, thoughtful structure, he gains the wisdom that enables him to use properly the knowledge he has gained. So in the fourth step, as he stands faithfully against the efforts of the cohesion of Mother Nature, he develops the strength to take the dominion first over his own body, then over the forces about him. See Butler's Seven Creative Principles. In an ordinary lifetime, man cannot develop to where he can gain and use all the God powers possible to him. The psalmist cries, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commandeth the blessing, even life forevermore. We are informed, the last enemy that is to be destroyed is death. Also the words, as the Father hath life in himself, even so hath he given to the Son, which is the Christ body, the gathered and organized body of the sons of God, to have life in himself. Therefore this body of the sons of God can say, even as God said, I lift up my hand and say, I live forever. For these sons of God have now become an integral part of the Eternal One, and because they live forever, forever they will advance continually to higher and yet higher states. Jesus expressed the thought of a man becoming united with God when he said, I and my Father are one. Also in his prayer to the Father, Jesus said that they, his followers, may be one in us. We read in Revelation that after the body of the 144,000 of the sons of God are gathered and sealed, Revelation 8, and have overcome the power of death for 1,000 years, they will grow and develop, Revelation 20, until the time as kings and priests unto God, they shall take the dominion under the whole heaven and shall reign forever and ever. 
the heights by great men gained and kept were not attained by sudden flight. But they, while their companions slept, were toiling upwards in the night. For heaven is not reached by a single bound. We build the ladder by which we rise from the lowly earth to the vaulted skies and mount to its summit round by round. In the process of initiation into the fourth degree in the order of Melchizedek, the neophyte is tested to prove his strength to hold and to turn back the forces of involution in his own organism. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.